The reason why you're not seeing the security talk live is because somebody was so anxious to watch it that they did a man in the middle attack so that they could stream it directly and have all the fun by themselves. Just kidding. Enjoy the show. So I have several big announcements to make in this video. The first one is going to be something special. As you might have noticed, the PC security channel is pretty close to 10,000 subscribers and we're also edging on towards 2 million views. So I want to thank everybody for that. Thank you all for your support. I really appreciate it and I wanted to do something special. I went ahead and asked AV Comparatives for an interview and it actually worked out so in an upcoming video maybe the next security talk I will be interviewing Peter Stelzhammer who is the co-founder of AV Comparatives so if you have any questions for him you can post them down in the comments below or you can send an email to the PC security channel at live.com for those of you who don't know AV Comparatives is a very large scale antivirus anti-malware testing organization if you've seen an advanced plus rating or certification on a certain product's website that's what AV Comparatives does anyway so just post your questions down below or uh, send me an email and if I like it it will be part of the interview so now let's go to our first topic and uh, this is also something pretty important that I want to talk about so bleeping computer is being sued by Enigma Software over a negative review of Spy Hunter. And if you actually click on the link, it's not even a negative review, it's just a forum post. I mean, this is not even something that Bleeping Computer have said officially. It's just people expressing their opinion on a forum. And I do not see any reason why that is not okay. I mean, it's literally an attack on freedom of speech. As you know, lawsuits can be expensive. It's not always possible for people to go into these big lawsuits with organizations. But I'm really happy that Bleeping Computers has taken this up because if they had not done this, maybe uh, Enigma Software would have gone against the person who posted the negative review or whatever. And that would be even more unfair. So I'm glad Bleeping Computer have taken this up, but they need the help of the community. They're asking uh, help to crowdfund their lawsuit or their defense against Enigma Software. So go ahead, guys, check this out. This is very important. And uh, it's not just a one is to one case between Bleeping Computer and um, Enigma Software. The context here is much bigger. As it says over here, if Bleeping Computer does not get help and we lose this battle, it will only embolden Enigma Software to try to silence other bloggers, ID technicians, or computer security enthusiasts. I mean, we should always have space for negative reviews because that's where all the improvements come from. And the right course of action for Enigma Software would have been to create a post and clarify this, but instead they just decided to file a lawsuit over this, which just makes no sense to me whatsoever. The quote over here, freedom isn't free. I mean, that is what we're seeing a lot in today's world. You really have to stand up for your rights. So let's move on to the next topic. FireEye have uh, made this report on the Drydex botnet. You know, botnet is one of those types of malware that it infects several computers and then uses the computing power or the collective computing power of all those computers to target large-scale DDoS attacks and things like that. So how this malware spreads is you get these spam emails and if we look at these charts, they're mostly focused on the United States and uh, companies that are into manufacturing. They've made a nice pie chart here. You can go ahead and check it out. All the links will be in the description. And usually you get a mail like this, British Gas. So there's an email attachment, and if you go ahead and open it, it seems like an official email. But if you do open it, you're going to get infected. So stay away from spam emails like this. Make sure you take a look at the address from where it's coming, 
before you open an email. Don't just jump straight to the content. Verify the source first, no matter how legitimate it looks. Because as you can see, some of these emails do look like a traditional, you know, office email. Doesn't mean they're legit. So the next topic. This is a really nice post from Naked Security by Sophos, and、uh, they have made a collection of what different U.S. presidential candidates have said about privacy. Information is very important here. You need to know what the people you're voting for think about key issues like this one. And if we want to have privacy on the internet anymore, we really have to take this seriously because the U.S. government has taken several steps that are just going to totally. I mean, there's always an assault on the user's privacy. They want a backdoor in all our devices. They don't want devices to use encryption. It's it's just insane. It's going totally out of hand, and、uh, you need to check this out. So Ted Cruz, he says, when the focus of law enforcement and national security is on ordinary citizens rather than targeting the bad guy, we miss out the bad guys while violating the constitutional rights of other citizens. And、uh, that's a fair statement. Donald Trump says、um, hmm, Americans will be willing to give up some privacy for more safety. I totally would not agree to that statement. And、um, Jeb Bush, he says, well, make sure that evil doers aren't in our midst. So he wants a less private internet. Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of disappointing to read this list because most of the candidates are anti-privacy. But I really liked Bernie Sanders' version here. He says, "You will all be amazed, or maybe not, about the amount of information private companies and the government has in terms of the websites that you access, the products that you buy, where you are at this very moment." And that is very much true. Everybody wants our data these days, and Windows 10 is one of the best examples of private organizations. Not to mention government organizations like NSA. We really need to get our act together and make the message clear that the public does want privacy. They don't want the government to infringe upon their private space. We don't want somebody outside the window looking at what we do just to make sure everything's safe. That's not how we want things to be. So let me know your thoughts in the comments about privacy and what is your view of、um, what the government's been doing, or more specifically, what the U.S. government's been doing in the past few years about、um, wanting backdoors into encrypted services and things like that. So we'll just move on, but this is something you definitely need to read. So now we'll move to something that is a little bit different: Windows vulnerabilities. I've heard this opinion a lot of times. There are some people who think that vulnerabilities are just going to become less and less prevalent, and the companies that develop operating systems are going to patch up all the problems, and then maybe in the future we won't need security programs anymore. That's definitely not happening because the Windows vulnerabilities have jumped up by 50% in 2015, and this is only going to get worse as we move into more and more devices. For example, a lot of things may not be looked at as security vulnerabilities when they're on, a, let's say, a phone or a desktop computer. But when you put that technology into another device, let's say a smart home. Some minor communication or code that previously didn't have any significance could turn out to be a major problem. You could turn into a situation where, okay, this this thing when I do it on my Android device, it just、um, you know, let's say, it just changes the brightness, which is okay. I don't really care, but you know, when it's your thermostat, you realize. Some application messes with that part of the code, and that can turn your house into a freezer or a furnace. If we don't figure out the implementation soon enough and have enough security, there are going to be a lot of scary possibilities in the future. Talking about new technology, here's another cool article. A drone had a really close call with an airplane, and this has been happening in a lot of U.S. and U.K. airports recently. And as drones become more and more sophisticated, I think they need some kind of regulation. Because right now they're just like toys; anybody can go out and get a drone. 
And as they keep getting bigger and more significant, I think the possibilities of things going wrong is going to increase so much. Like just imagine a drone getting hit by an airplane or rather an airplane getting hit by a drone. The owner loses the drone, but more importantly, it can damage the engine of an airplane and potentially cause a tragic incident, maybe a plane crash. So we definitely don't want things like that to happen. Currently, I mean, how things are done, how do we make sure that airplanes don't collide in midair? We have strict airspace rules and regulations at what altitude you can fly. There are specific air routes. It's not just like, you know, the sky's yours, just enjoy yourself. But that is pretty much how it is with drones, so maybe we need to set some laws. Now, we have to be careful here. I know there are a lot of uh, governments that are trying to do this the wrong way. You don't want people to have fun with their drones. I'm not at all saying that. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, we need to understand the maybe once a drone is big enough or something, you need some kind of uh, you know, some kind of airspace restrictions. At least we can do this near airports and stuff so that incidents like this are not going to become a problem. So take a look at the Malware Museum. Anybody remembers the time when Malware was just about having fun? There was a time, I mean, Malware makers would just make Malware to disrupt activities in organizations or you know, just play a joke on people. There'd be those um, very visually depictive Malware, like you could have a laughing skull or you know, some weird message displayed on the screen. And the Malware Museum has a lot of such old school malware. So if you're a security enthusiast like me or you just love playing around with malware, just go and check out the site. I think you'll love it. It has a ton of stuff. I'll have the link in the description as I promised. So Google is planning to fight extremist propaganda with AdWords. Seriously, Google? So uh, this, this is quite, um, quite funny, actually. If you are going to type something like, I want to join ISIS or something along those lines, Google is actually going to display ads to try to change your mind. So you're going to see nice messages on your search results. And uh, there's also a whole YouTube playlist, I believe, where they've made several videos uncovering the reality of terrorist organizations like ISIS and uh, just to discourage people from falling into their trap. I don't know if this is really going to work because if, you've, if you're crazy enough to join ISIS, do all kind of crap, I, I, I don't think that a search result or an ad in a Google search is going to change your mind or it's going to fix your mind. But a welcome step nonetheless. I guess it's nice of Google to take out that penny from their ad revenue and try to you know do this it's it's a nice step but how effective i don't know i don't think it's really going to make a huge difference so eset have released an article saying that businesses are being increasingly targeted by ransomware ransomware is becoming more and more common these days because it's financially beneficial to the creators I mean, there's an immediate financial benefit that you get. And with businesses, the importance is much more because some business data is worth a lot of money. And if you can encrypt that data, well, I can think of a lot of cases where the company will be willing or may have no choice but to pay a huge amount to get that data back. So just back up. It shouldn't be something that you just do once in a while. It, it should just be part of your daily routine, especially in business organizations. They definitely need really good backup strategies to combat this because no matter how good of a security solution you have, I don't think that it can guarantee absolute security in these days. It's just not going to happen. So you might as well back up your data just to be safe. And especially when the data is important. I think businesses should have like a daily backup scheduling or something like that for all their computers and have a secondary server where they just uh, have a duplicate copy of all their data and that should be like disconnected from the internet. Next we're going to talk about this uh, doorbell which gave out Wi-Fi passwords to anybody with a screwdriver. Now this is exactly why IoT can so quickly turn into a horror. 
we are just not ready for having all these devices running on the internet. And the problem is the manufacturers of these devices don't necessarily know the entire back end and how the operating systems function. For example, right now everybody's taking these uh, Android variants and putting them on refrigerators, doing all that, but they're not really doing the implementation from ground up. They're just taking the existing implementation on phones and they're just adding another layer of compatibility on top of that just to work with that particular device. Device, and that is going to lead to a lot of problems in the future. I think we really need to rethink IoT and develop it from the ground up because we don't want things like that to happen. So this is a nice article. You can go ahead and check it out. It's really funny because this doorbell is supposed to be a security utility. I mean, it has CCTV camera monitoring and an intercom to talk to whoever's knocking, but at the same time, anybody wants to just pull it open, they can steal your Wi-Fi password. So there's a lot of irony there. Fake Amazon mail is phishing for your login information. So guys, don't fall for this. I'm just going to show you guys the screenshot so that you have this picture in your mind. So next time you see it, you know it's spam. So Google actually does classify these emails as spam, but this is just something that's going around these days. So you get an email saying, welcome, as a valued customer, we would like to present you the opportunity to get free money. I mean, anytime you see anybody saying, here's free money, you know, it, it's, it's a scam, right? We're offering 10 pounds to a very selected number of customers in exchange for completing a quick survey. The reason why this is uh, so successful is because it doesn't do that usual hey here's just just take your money just click on the link and we have 10 billion dollars for you but uh this is more believable so you do an amazon survey you get 10 pounds somebody might think that this might actually work might be legit but it's not so just don't do it and once again a little bit of caution goes a long way if you could just uh, take a look at the address from where you're receiving the email and uh, make sure it's legit, maybe just cross confirm it with the product web page to make sure that if there's really something like that going on, you can easily avoid a lot of stuff like this. But Google and uh, a lot of the mail clients are pretty good at picking up spam like this, so it'll usually end up in your spam folder. And uh, you really have to be silly to go into your spam folder, pick up a message, then click on the link, and then, you know, just give out your data, whatever. So the last topic for today is going to be DMA Locker, which is another new ransomware variant. The funny thing about this one is the malware developers actually claim that the encryption used here is very strong and it's unbreakable, but it's actually very weak. And Malwarebytes have taken it apart. They even have a very nice update here. It says, if you are a victim of DMA Locker, please contact us and supply a sample of your encrypted files and maybe we'll be able to help you. So if anybody is infected by this ransomware, you can try this out take a look here it's actually pretty interesting they've really gone in depth with this and the important thing is the key in this case was not even rsa encrypted and it wasn't even randomly generated it was just stored in the original file so decryption should be possible in this case and you can actually get your data back without having to pay the ransom so that is going to be it for this security talk episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts on these topics in the comments down below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like it if you did and uh, don't forget to share it with your friends and whoever might be able to use this information. And don't forget to subscribe to the PC security channel for more. We have a lot of awesome stuff coming up, including the interview that I talked about earlier. So thank you for watching and as always, stay informed. Stay secure.